اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله الذي كان موجودا قبل حدوث الاشیاء ويبقى بعد فناء الاشیاء تفرد بالاولیه والقدم ووسم كل شيء مع ووسم كل شيء مع ذا بالفناء والعدم كما قال الزشان كل شيء هالك الا وجهه وكل نفس ذائقة الموت وقال كل من عليها فاني ويبقى وجه ربك ذو الجلال والإكرام سبحان من لا يخفى عليه اختلاف النيات ولا يعزب عنه معاس العباد في الخلوات سبحان الله الذي منه خلقة العباد وإليه المعاد ومن يعمل مثقال ذرة خير يره ومن يعمل مثقال ذرة شر يره نشهد أن لا إله إلا هو الملك الذي لا ينازع في ملكه ولا يضاد في حكمه يعذب من يشاء بما يشاء كيف يشاء ويرحم من يشاء بما يشاء كيف يشاء تعذيبه المسيين عدن وأفه تفضل ونشهد أن محمدا سيد المرسلين وخير المبشرين والمنذرين صلى الله عليه وآله الهجاة المهديين من ركب سفينتهم نجا واهتدى ومن تخلف عنها ظل فغرق وهوى اوصيكم بعد الله بالاعتصام بالتقوى فانه حبل متين وعروة وثقى فقال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو اصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن ان بعض الظن اثم ولا تجسسوا ولا يخطب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أعهدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله إن الله تواب الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin by exhorting myself and all of you to adopt the taqwa of Allah as it's the best of provisions the verse that I recited and deviating from our regular discussion on khutbah muttaqeen um, inshallah we'll talk about this especially when we are going through this month of rajab inshallah maybe a couple of times in the month of uh, shaban so that we can prepare ourselves better for the month of ramadan the verse is from chapter number 49 surah hujurat verse number 12 a very commonly recited verse um, in any dars akhlaq or lesson as far as the morals and ethics is concerned. The translation is this, avoid suspicion as much as possible. Some suspicions are considered sins. Espy not on each other, nor speak ill of each other behind their backs. Would you like eating your brother's flesh? Nay, you abhor it. Fear Allah, he's oft returning and merciful. Many different concepts are being addressed over here. One concept is the concept of being suspicious of another individual. Second is spying on other individuals. And third, you know, doing their ghibat or talking behind their back and which is known as backbiting. These three things are being discussed and there's a certain relationship between all three of these things. Now we talk about that we are the followers of Ahl Bayt and we are the you know, followers and the adherer of this book, which is known as Quran, the last revelation that came upon our Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. But if we just say that from our tongues and not implement it into our lives, then we're just misleading ourselves, no one else. And this is where we see it's a very common practice in our societies, yet it is a very straight, straightforward, simple address in Quran, which is condemning any sort of suspicion, spying, or, you know, backbiting. But you see, this is a common practice, you know, without even giving too much thought to it, we are suspicious of other people, we are spying on other people, and then we're talking behind their backs so easily that Quran is talking about it, and this is something which is mentioned over and over again. We see at another place in Surah Nur, verse number 12, Allah says, Lawla is sami'atumuhu Treat false reports on others like false reports on you. This is how Quran wants us to look at this spying, suspicion, and 
backbite. He said, if there is a false report, rumor flying around about someone, you verify that. You don't go ahead and start spreading that. If there's suspicion about someone's activity, you don't go ahead and start slandering that person without any basis. Secondly, how would you feel if the same was going around about you and people were talking? Definitely, you wouldn't want anyone else doing the same for you. Therefore, you should in return be keeping that in mind as well. We see it means don't listen to false accusation on someone. Have husnilan. That means have good understanding and uh, you know positive thinking about others instead of having a negative thinking about others. Treat them as your own nufus. Treat them as your own selves. This suspicion and doubt, whether good or bad, is not in our control, since it is a reaction to a chain of events that are reflected in our mind. So we hear about something. And then, you know, something might have happened to us regarding this person in the past. And those things put together right away, we start developing this suspicion. Therefore, denial or nahi in this verse is an effect of which is naturally coming into our minds. But you can remove its effects and that is in your control. So yes, what you do with it afterwards is something that is in your control. Having these thoughts come into your mind may be out of your control. So yes, thoughts might come, but how do you react to it? How do you go about it? That is definitely which is in your control. There are different types of suspicion and negative mindset. Suspicion have different types, some of which are good and some are bad. One is suspicion in Allah. A lot of people, and it's not just we're making a claim. Quran talks about it. A lot of people have suspicion in Allah. That, what is a suspicion? Suspicion is that you suspect if that person can do this or not. If that person has done this or not. If that person is capable of doing that or not. So, similar type of suspicion exists in the minds of many folks in regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can Allah do this or not? And Quran talks about it. As we read in the hadith, which says, uh, first the hadith and then the ayah, a person who fears for the expense Expenses and way of living would become hard upon him once he gets married is doing what? Suspicion in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran says, you know, one kahul ayama minkum was salihina min ibadakum imaikum in yakunu fukara yugnihum Allah min fadli. That marry the young male and female among you who are not married yet. And if they are poor, Allah will enrich them out of his bounty. So the fact that you're saying that what will happen, how will I support, and right now I'm alone. I can do this, but then when I have a wife and I have kids later on, how will it happen? How will it work? You're doing a suspicion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, suspecting the way that Allah is feeding you right now, the way Allah is providing for you right now, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be able to duplicate or make it better for you when you get married. So this is a suspicion on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second is suspicion against people as mentioned in this verse that we look at different people in our society right away we make up our mind based on something that we've heard about them or that which has happened to us with them in our interaction in the past right away we're suspicious of those people and we try to you know sort of distance ourselves from them third is suspicion against oneself and that is definitely a good thing so having suspicion on Allah is bad having suspicion on others is bad but having suspicion on your own self is a positive thing it is very very important that we learn that insan should not feel you know all good about everything that you do husnazan in regards to your own activity is false yes husnazan having a positive mindset about others activities is a good thing but having a husnazan about your own deeds and your own activities is actually misleading yourself having you know feeling this way about yourself and think that all of his actions are without defects is definitely leading insan towards this downfall amir al-mu'minin ali ibn abi talib alayhi salatu was salam in that khutbah muttaqin that we've been discussing for quite some time he considers suspicion against ourselves to be a quality of the pious and a level of perfection we must have talked about it when we were discussing the khutbah muttaqin that it had come that among the attributes of muttaqin is that they are suspicious of their own self. What they have done, is it enough, is it not enough, and so on and so forth. Of course, those who do not find any flaws in themselves are lacking knowledge and faith. And I'll give you proof of that. The nur, the essence of their knowledge is very little. 
You know, obviously when you attain knowledge, there's this nur that is inside. Can you show this knowledge? You show this knowledge through the effects of this knowledge is by doing the work that you are in that area. So you studied medicine, then you go in and become a doctor. You study something else, that how, that's how you prove it. But there's an essence and the nur of all of these things that you have studied, the knowledge that you possess. This is very little and there's very little nur with it and they're unable to see things clearly. And I'll give you an example. With one light, for example, at nighttime, this hall right here, if there's only one light in it, you know, one small candle which is lit in this hall, for example, you would not be able to see, you'll only probably be able to see the bigger objects that are in this hall. For example, you might be able to see the chandelier, you might be able to see the doors, you might be able to see the walls or the window. But with this one small light, you will not be able to see the minor details of this room. Only until this room is lit and bright and has more nur in it is the bright daytime that you're able to see even the smallest of the details how you know crafted this person was who designed it or you know other things that you see in this room only they're capable of seeing them when when there's more nur when there's more light when this place is illuminated but when there's only single light in it you will not be able to see the minor details that is the problem that when we lack faith and knowledge there's little nur in it when there's little nur in it we only see major sins bigger sins oh i haven't committed theft i haven't killed anyone I haven't committed adultery now, Billah. I haven't done these things. So when I'm having this little nur, I can only see the big sins. And I say, oh, I haven't done this, I haven't done this. So then I'm all pious. But then I neglect because of lack of nur, the smaller things that I have done. And I'm unable to see them because of lack of essence and lack of nur that exists in me. Sallallahu Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So likewise, those who have very weak nur only see their bigger sins. But when they're lacking this big nur, they're unable to see their smaller sins. And that's where these shortcomings start piling up. Don't have the smallest amount of suspicion for anyone. Having suspicion about yourself is a very good thing. But we have suspicion about others and we have lack of suspicion about our own selves. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, لا تظننن بكلمة خرجت من أحد سوءا وأنت تجد لها في الخير محتملة do not regard an expression uttered by any person as evil if you can find it capable of bearing some good. Short sayings from Nahjul Balagha. Even if that sentence has something good in it, don't start you know, sus being suspicious of what this person has said or start taking the meaning from one place to another. This is what we see, the manipulation that is going on in the media especially. You take you know, half of the sentence from someone's speech and then you take it out of context and right away there's suspicions, suspicious regarding that sentence. So Imam is saying, do not regard an expression uttered by any person as evil if you can find any good bearing, capable of bearing some good. Some look at it from the perspective of half glass being empty or half glass being full. Look at it from the aspect being positive. Don't be negative. Oh, this is not there. Masjid is here, Masjid is built, oh, it's lacking this, you know, house of Allah is there, oh, it doesn't have this. Well, it doesn't have that, but it has many other things. You know, you, you're looking for, for example, a spouse, you say, well, this, they don't have this, they don't have this, they don't have this. Look at the things that they do possess, things that they have currently. That should be your way of looking at things. Do not be suspicious of anyone. Second, second thing, that Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Muhammad. So the first thing was in this ayah, do not do one, do not be suspicious. Second thing that this, this ayah is telling us, wala tajassasu. So when you are suspicious of someone, what does it lead to? Tajassus. You start spying. Because you're suspecting something is there, you're not sure, then you go after and you spy. And you look for that thing, you go down to the bottom of it. Don't spy on anyone. It is there to bring out the secrets of the people and Islam doesn't permit this to leak anyone's secret. There are many examples that we've talked about. I won't get in the, go into the details. It's very self-explanatory. It is there to protect people because if everyone is allowed to do this, it will use, they will use this knowledge to defame others. And we see that today in the society in the form of news, newspapers or in other media forms that we have or even the social media that we have, how people are exposed, let alone other people. People are exposing themselves 
through the Facebook and the Twitters and all these other things, they're exposing themselves, not even realizing what they're posting up on their pages and how it could be affected towards themselves. But this is allowed only, there's obviously, you know, exception to every law. This is only allowed for officials and, you know, used by the authorities for the betterment of the whole society. Yes, if they have these agencies which are spying on possible, you know, wrongdoers and where they feel there's some sort of threat, obviously this is something which is allowed. You won't want to say, no, Quran says you can't spy on anyone, so therefore these spying agencies, they're haram. No, that's not the case. When there's a betterment for the society, this is something which is allowed. Lastly, the ayat of Quran says, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا do not speak ill of anyone behind their back. Basically, this is the end result of the first two things. You are suspicious of someone, then you spy on them, and then you go ahead and talk behind their back. You heard something, you spied a little bit, you got to some sort of conclusion or not, and then you go ahead and talk about them behind their back to someone else. Shin. Did you hear that? Did you hear about that? Oh, I've heard about so. -so. Did you hear about that? Right away, this ghibat starts at that point. And we don't even realize this, how commonly this is something which is practiced in the society. You know, we call ourselves, inshallah, we are all mu'mineen. In fact, we're talking about khutbah muttaqeen, trying to get ourselves to be beyond the level of mu'min and get to the level of taqwa. Yet we see the practice of tajassus, the practice of spying, is suspicion, and then eventually ghibat is so commonly practiced in our societies. Would you like to eat the flesh of your dead brother? That's the comparison, the analogy the Quran gives. Yes, the embodiment of the actions, tajassume amal as we call it. Every action that we do here, there's the embodiment of that action. You know, the person who did the ghibah, that woman, that woman that came to Prophet uh, during Ramadan, Prophet offered her to eat something. She said, Prophet, I'm fasting, it's Ramadan. Why would you offer me something? Prophet said, no, you're not, your fast is gone. You broke it, you ate something. She said, no, I haven't eaten some, anything. I can swear from the morning till now I've been fasting. She said, hey, Prophet said, no. You have just ate, eaten something and your fast is gone. Go ahead and eat it officially. She was surprised. Prophet said, you are unable to see, but I can see that the tajassum, the embodiment of your actions, the fact that you committed, you know, ghibat of someone just recently, just, just a little while ago, I could see the athar of the flesh and blood hanging from your mouth. There's something the Prophet is able to see. So therefore he said, you know, you have broken your fast. So fast is not just abstaining from physically eating something, but the fact that you've performed this ghibah has broken your fast as well. That's why when we read the ayat in Ramadan, I said this, these two months are prelude to Ramadan. When we read the ayat of Ramadan, We say, where is this taqwa? We haven't become muttaqeen. We've been fasting for 50 years. Why? Because we are just abstaining from food and drink during the month of Ramadan. We're not abstaining from ghibat and lying and all these other things during the month of Ramadan. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He said, would you like to eat the flesh of your dead brother, mu'min and Muslim? This is a comparison, suspicion, a spy and ghibat equals to eating the flesh of your dead brother. Why the mention of dead brother? Why not brother who's alive? Because dead is someone who's unable to defend themselves. When you talk behind someone's back, that means that person is not present there and they're unable to defend themselves. When they're unable to defend themselves, it becomes ghibat. That's why Quran is saying dead brother, not the one who's alive. Because you're doing the ghibat of that who's no longer there. So this is indeed a result of being hasty and not thinking. We slander people so easily without realizing how honorable a mu'min is in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just imagine the height of the azamat of a mu'min in the sight of Allah. Our Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he, said, he actually looked and Rasulullah nadara ila al-Ka'bah faqala marhaban bil bayti ma'adhama ma'adhamaka wa'adhama hurmataka ala Allah. He looked at the bayt of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the house of Allah, the Kaaba, and says, Marhaba, of the house of Allah, how exalted you are and what exalted place do you have? Wallahi lil mu'minu a'adhamu hurmatan minka. But by God, with all the height and the exaltedness that you have, mu'min has more height and azamu daraja or has higher exalted place than you. A mu'min. 
Prophet is saying this. Why? He said, لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمَ مِنْكَ وَاحِدَةً There's one thing that is haram in muhtaram as far as you are concerned. وَمِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِ ثَلَاثَةً But when mu'min is concerned, there are three things which are considered to be honorable towards mu'min. مَا لَهُ وَدَمَهُ وَأَنْ يَذُنَّ بِهِ ذَنَّسُ His wealth, his blood, and someone being suspicious of him. These are the three things where a person should keep an honor of a mu'min in mind. So this is the reason why Kaaba has more, or the insan mu'min has a more higher status or exalted place than this Kaaba. So we see that this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees or keeps an honor of a mu'min, yet the same mu'min we go ahead and slander so easily and break apart all of the rules and law and break the grandeur of that mu'min and the taqaddus without any hesitation. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad. And there are many examples of such good suspicion by God for thieves and bandits. There was a story um, that I read. There was a group of uh, bandits and uh, these, uh, you know, um, they were famous for robbing caravans. You know, this was something which was a practice done even from the early days of Islam um, because, you know, caravans traveling between few cities. And obviously, uh, be during, between the cities, there's really no place uh, you know there's no life over there nobody's living there so and there's no law there so there's lawlessness and people would go ahead and loot and rob these caravans one of these uh, group of people who were famous for robbing nobody knew who they were they were always there and they were always robbing and nobody would be able to get away from them but then one day they weren't able to find any caravan so you know they said to themselves what are we gonna do tonight they come back into the city they show themselves to be mujahideen fi sabilillah. How funny that today is the same story that there's these mujahideen fi sabilillah who are really robbers and bandits and there's no lawless, law, law as far as they're concerned. So they came inside the city, they go into this uh, mehman sara, the place where caravans usually stay to see if there are any caravans that have come today or what, what's going on. So they go to this mehman sara, this place where they could stay, you can call it to be a hotel. And they entered, you know, the owner saw these people, everybody, you know, looking um, like mu'mineen. And they said, who are you? He said, well, we're mujahideen fi sabilillah. Right away when the owner heard that they're mujahideen fi sabilillah, he welcomed them. He, you know, took care of them. He provided them with food. He provided them with, you know, place to stay that night. You can spend as long as you want to. They saw that there was a boy, there was a son of this owner who was uh, obviously handicapped. And uh, they didn't pay attention, they ate their food and they went to sleep. The owner said to his wife, you know, the remnants of the food that they have left over food from these mujahideen fi sabilillah, feed that to our kid. Because the hadith of Rasul says, Su'urul mu'mine shifa'un. The leftover of a mu'min has cure in it. If a mu'min leaves something left over, don't throw it away. There's cure in it. So a wife listened and then, you know, fed the child who was handicapped. These people got up in the morning, they left, went back to their work again. The second day, they still didn't find any caravan. They said, well, we have a place to stay now. That person always greets us. They go back to the same place. They saw the same child who was handicapped though yesterday is now walking around. I said, what happened? This child was handicapped until yesterday. He said, because of you. Your leftover food, because you are mujahideen fi sabilillah, that's how you introduce yourself. The leftover food that you had left, I fed it to my child. And because of the, you know, shifa, the, the cure it had, because of you are mujahideen fi sabilillah, it ended up curing my child. These people felt to themselves that, look, we presented falsely ourselves to be mujahideen fi sabilillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has so graciously kept that that we presented ourselves to be mujahideen and he portrayed and he showed to these people and they made us believe that we are definitely mujahideen fi sabilillah there was lesson for both of them they left their wrong habits as well and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how protected them and their reality from being revealed to other individuals 
I'm running out of my time. I mean, he said, Dhanna al insan, mizan al Doubts and suspicion of someone is the mizan and the scale of their intellect. If someone is doubting and is suspicious and is spying all the time and talking behind others' back, that is the mizan and the scale and the balance of their intellect. If a person believes on every small suspicion about another, he or she is not very intellectual. I mean, he said, La imana ma'asu is zan, the one who is suspicious of another has no faith, none whatsoever there are many other things in this regard but um, you know towards the end when we are finishing off on this topic the 12th ayat of surah hujurat gives us very important message message of do not spy on other do not be suspicious of another and do not do ghibat of another why the two words that are used in another place one who makes a mistake or commits a sin and ascribes it to an innocent person you've done it then you go ahead and ascribe it to another innocent person he only burdens himself with the slander and the grave sin it's called bohjan when there's something in another individual it still is called ghibat on your behalf and when that thing is not there in that individual it's ghibat alongside with slander that you're committing bohjan that you are doing about it so the two words that are being used over here our sixth imam imam jafar sadiq said Ascribing Bhutan and slandering someone that which they don't have with, and to an innocent person is heavier than mountains. You're not able to accumulate or understand the weight of that Bhutan or the slander that you have done. And we see, unfortunately, this sort of Bhutan, this sort of slandering when it comes to marital life. Yes, when as long as they're married, their relationship is good, nothing is wrong. But then right away, if there's some sort of, you know, um, separation that is happening or people are trying to mediate between them, right away these suspicions come about. We see these suspicions lie around within our community as well as around us in the globe. We see people going to the extreme by falsely accusing someone for wrongdoing and then taking revenge only later to find out that their actions were baseless and they were based on false reports. You would imagine a person or a nation would learn from the past mistakes, but you're blinded by your own ego, false pride and vengeance, and there's no hope in that. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq, to not hear just suspicions here and there, and then put our ears to that. Rather, do tahqiq and research before believing into it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq, to stay away from suspicious activities, suspicion, spying on others, also from committing ghibat of another individual. Inna hasil hadith wa ablaghal mu'idha, kitab Allah ya'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, والأسر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين من وعمل الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا إله إلا هو الحليم الكريم غافر الذنب وقابل التوبة وهو الغفور الرحيم سبحان من سبقت رحمته غضبه وبسط الرحمة بسط اليدين بالرحمة سبحان من لم